Hello, I'm Larry Wilson, and welcome to seminar number 212, parts 7 and 8. We are studying the book of Ezekiel in this seminar series, and I hope you haven't missed a single study. In our last study, we examined three issues surrounding the call of Ezekiel when the Lord called him to be a prophet. Now remember, Ezekiel is just a young man, uh, 30, about 30 years of age, and the Lord gave Ezekiel the words to say. And, re and remember, the words of the Lord were represented as a book that Ezekiel was told there at the end of chapter 1 and beginning of chapter 2. Uh, he was told to take this book and, excuse me, end of chapter 2 and beginning of chapter 3, and to eat this little book, and he said in his mouth it was sweet, and in his stomach it was bitter. So the words that Ezekiel uh, was going to speak was not his own assessment of Israel's problems. He was a conduit. Ezekiel was going to be a channel through which God would speak to his people. We also find uh, in Ezekiel chapter 3 that the Lord promised that to, to harden Ezekiel's forehead, representing the fact that Ezekiel would be strengthened by the Lord to present the Word of God with, with unvarnished clarity to those that were in rebellion against the Lord. Now, let me tell you something. It takes a lot of internal fortitude if your heart is filled with love and you have any concern or caring for others, to tell them that they are in error. It takes a lot of fortitude to confront others and to tell them they are in error unless the heart is filled with self-righteousness or anger and then it's quite easy to tell somebody how the cow ate the cabbage. <laughs> you ever notice how some people they really can't confront others until they get so angry themselves that they just explode and then in the exploding they get it off their chest. Well, how do you do that with 45 years or 30 years in the case of Ezekiel? You see, Ezekiel isn't the one that's angry at his people, it's the Lord. And, and the Lord is giving Ezekiel the words to tell, to tell the elders and the people of, of Israel what the Lord says and, and of course, the message that comes from God to the children of Israel only makes them angry. And they vent their anger, you guessed it, on the prophet. <laughs> this is why the lifespan of prophets has always been short. Now, you may remember that uh, Ezekiel was sent to the exiles with a message from the Lord. When he got there, he sat for seven days without saying anything, just totally overwhelmed. And then the Lord spoke to Ezekiel and explained uh, his options. I want to take you to the Bible and have you read with me what the Lord said to the young man. Okay, Ezekiel. When I say to a wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not warn him, or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life. That wicked man will die for his sin, and God says, I will hold you, Ezekiel, accountable for his blood. In other words, Ezekiel, if I give you something to say and you don't say it, then I will hold you accountable for his guilt, for his sin, for his death. But if you do warn the wicked man and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his evil ways, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. If I were to put it in my words, so Ezekiel your job is to speak my words to these people or their blood is on your head. Now, how would you like to have that resting on your shoulders? How would you like to have that responsibility 
bearing down on you. Especially if you were like Ezekiel, who was a very timid, a very shy, reluctant to speak kind of guy. God chooses the most unlikely people to do his work. And Ezekiel is, he's afraid of his shadow. <laughs> he gets there in the company of the elders and he sits there for seven days with, and refuses to say a word. And the Lord comes to him and says, look, Ezekiel, I understand. I understand. So I'm going to use you and have you conduct pantomimes and act out various signs through which my message to the Jews will be demonstrated. So I like to think of Ezekiel as the demonstration prophet. He's the prophet who is constantly demonstrating or pantomiming out the message to the Jews that God once said. And as the Jews watch him, now remember, they're in Babylon, the year is about 593 B.C. when Ezekiel begins to tell his story. He was taken in captivity about five years earlier in the 598 siege of Jerusalem. As, as Ezekiel um, is called and given the message, then he's too shy to talk, so he becomes a demonstrator. And when the Jews see him doing these strange things, their curiosity gets the best of them, and they come over to watch him, and then they start asking questions, and Ezekiel then can give the message. How clever of God to take into consideration the timidity and shyness of Ezekiel. I think that's neat. Now today we're going to examine chapter 4. And there are a few things about, uh, that, that's going to go on here in chapter 4 that I would like for you to, uh, to know about, uh, some uh, background information, if you will. And I want to take you uh, to chapter 4. Let's, let's read first the um, beginning of chapter 4, because we'll read the first six verses so that you know what we're going to be talking about. And let's just go back to the Bible to take a look. All right, the Lord says to Ezekiel, Son of man, take a clay tablet, put it in front of you, and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Okay, draw a picture of the city. Then lay siege to it, erect siege works against it, build a ramp up to it, set up camps against it, and put battering rams all around it. So basically what God is saying Ezekiel, take a piece of paper, clay tablet, draw the city, and draw all of these things around the city so that when people come to look at what you're doing, I want you to show them your drawing. Now, let's understand something. The year is 592 B.C. The dis total destruction of Jerusalem, we now know, is going to occur in 586. Okay? So we are about six years, seven years, away from the ultimate final total destruction of Jerusalem. It's the third siege by Nebuchadnezzar when he totally plows the city under. Now, at this point in time, these people in Babylon don't know what is coming and the fate of their city is going to be. No one knows what God is about to do. And certainly the people in Jerusalem who are still there. See, Nebuchadnezzar didn't decimate the city in 598 or 597 when he set siege to it again and took Ezekiel as a captive. He didn't totally decimate the city. And Nebuchadnezzar is trying to get the Jews to cooperate and to submit to his higher authority. And so God is now going to be speaking through Ezekiel about what he's going to do to Jerusalem. So draw a picture. Draw a picture. You got it? All right. Let's go back to the Bible. Verse 3. Okay, Ezekiel, take an iron pan, a skillet, 
and place it as an iron wall between you and the city and turn your face toward it. So hold up a skillet between you and the city and turn your face toward it. It will be under siege and you shall besiege it. This will be a sign to the house of Israel. All right, what does this mean? What does this text say? Take this iron skillet or iron pan, place it as an iron wall between you and the city, and turn your face toward it. It will be under siege, and you shall besiege it. All right. If I were looking at you, and I were to hold up an iron pan between us so that my face could not be seen, that would indicate that the face and the favor of God upon the city is blocked with the iron pan. What, what this is, what this is a, a pantomime of is that when time comes for the siege of the city, none of the prayers of the people within will reach the face of God. The iron skillet, the iron wall between God and the city prevents any of the petitions of the, those under siege from being heard. This iron pan is an iron curtain, if you will, indicating that God is going to not listen. He's not going to pay attention. He's not going to give consideration to the requests that come from those in the city. You understand? You, you see how this is playing out? This has to do with Jerusalem. And Ezekiel is pantomiming and representing what is coming. All right, now... Let's go down to verse 4, 5, and 6. The Lord told Ezekiel, I want you to lie on your left side and put the sin of the house of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. Okay, so you're going to lay down each day for a period of time on your left side, Ezekiel, and I'm going to assign you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days, you will bear the sin of the house of Israel. Israel. Remember, Israel is the ten northern kingdoms that were destroyed in 722 B.C. We are now at 592 B.C., about 180 years uh, later. And um, let's see, 722, no, about 150 years later, I guess it would be. Uh, and God is saying, look, the reason that Jerusalem is under siege is because of the sin of its people. And, I, and, and I'm counting, God says, I'm counting 390 years of apostasy for the house of Israel. Now let's go back to the Bible and look at verse 6. After you have finished this little sign, then start lying down again, this time on your right side, your favored side, and bear the sin of the house of Judah, which is the southern portion of the kingdom. And I have assigned you 40 days, a day for each year of their sins and their apostasy. So the total number of days that Ezekiel is going to lie on his left and then on his right side is a total of 430 days. Now, the reason this is interesting, the reason this is kind of fascinating because you will find in Exodus 12 verses 40 and 41, the total time that Israel uh, is in Egypt and under the, the um, dominion of Pharaoh 
is counted as 430 years. And here, when we add 390 and 40, we again have 430 years. It's kind of an interesting parallel, isn't it? I think the, I think the point of the parallel is that just as Israel in slavery forgot God, Israel in Jerusalem did the very same thing, forgot God. Over in chapter 20 of Ezekiel, if you'll read that, you'll discover that God's anger with Israel in Egypt was very great. And when Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and, and there they said, please, God has met with us. Let us go into the wilderness for three days to make atonement with, for our sins or he will come and may come and strike us with a sword and kill us all. God revealed through Moses his great displeasure with the children of Abraham. And now here we are from the time of the Exodus down to the time of Ezekiel. That's a period of about uh, 850 years. God is saying, look, it's the same 430. Whether you're in Egypt or whether you're in Jerusalem, there's no difference. You turn your backs upon me and you've ab abandoned me and you no longer obey the terms and conditions set forth in the covenant. So, Ezekiel, you're going you're gonna to work out a little sign here. For 390 days, you're going to lay down at an appointed time each day on your left side. So, that's a little more than a year. And then after you've done that, you're going to lay down on your right side for 40 days. I've assigned you a day for a year. Now, I want to show you that uh, there's a lot behind this, and you've got to understand how God counts time. So let's go back to the Bible, and let's notice these words. Leviticus 25.1 The Lord said to Moses on Mount Sinai, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land, I am going to give you. The land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. The land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years, sow your fields, and for six years, prune your vineyards, and for six years, gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a Sabbath of rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards in the seventh year. A lot of people have mistakenly thought this is an agricultural package that God is putting together on how to manage the land. That's blatantly not true. This has nothing to do with agriculture. Zero. Don't even let it enter your mind. Because the sixth year is the most abundant year of all the harvests. In other words, if this were an agricultural issue, we would expect to see the land declining year after year in its productivity so that when we get to the sixth year, the land is just exhausted and it's got to rest. So the seventh year rest then would kind of give the land a chance to recover and then we start back off with the biggest harvest at the first year. That is not the case at all. If you'll read Leviticus 25, the entire chapter, you'll find that God turns it just around the other way and he says, look, your sixth year is your biggest year. You will have enough in the sixth year to last you through the seventh year while the land is observing its Sabbath of rest. This is not about agriculture. This is about faith. God uses his Sabbath to constantly test our faith, to test our relationship with him. God wanted Israel to rest from their works and allow him to provide for them. But if you go back and if you read Ezekiel 20, you'll find that Israel never kept God's Sabbaths. Not the way he had in mind anyway. And when Jesus is upon earth at the time of the Pharisees, they still 
have missed the entire point of observing the seventh day Sabbath. They even accused Jesus, the one who made the Sabbath, of breaking the Sabbath. Pharisees did. Well, we come to another question here that needs to be addressed. When we say every seventh year, we have to ask the question, seventh year counting from what? When we talk about the seventh day of the week, we're counting from what? The first day of the week, but what, when is the first day of the week? Where did the count of days begin? It began at creation. In creation, God on the first day said, let there be light. And the seventh day is called the seventh day because it's number seven from the very first day. Now, when we come to counting out the seventh year, which is holy to God in uh, Leviticus 25 and during the time of the theocracy, the question is, we're going to count off seven years, but the seventh year is counted from what? And the answer to that is found in Exodus 12, verses 1 and 2, where the Lord says, this is your first year, this is your first month, we start counting here. That the, the year of the Exodus took place in 1437 B.C., and the count of years began with the Exodus in 1437 B.C. So we're going to watch the seven years or this week of years unfold as we begin counting off units of seven. Every seventh year is a Sabbath year starting with the year of the Exodus. Now obviously out in the wilderness God's children did not need to keep uh, the land, did not need it rest because they weren't planting anything in the wilderness for 40 years. Manna fell from the heavens every day except the Sabbath and fed the children of Israel. So this is an interesting point to understand. The, the count of units of seven years began at the year of the Exodus, which is 1437 B.C. And I can demonstrate this date to be accurate uh, given enough time, so please be patient with me. In our uh, numerical counting scheme today, we use a base 10 system. A decade is 10 years. A decade is a period of time that begins with a zero year and ends with a ninth year. So zero through nine is 10. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So 1950 through 1959 is a decade. 1990 through, 19, through the year 2000 is a decade. And 10 decades is a century. That's because we use base 10 in our count of years. In God's count, he doesn't use 10 for counting years. God uses the base seven. Let's go back and look at this. A week of years, a week of days, it represents seven years, a day for a year. And seven weeks would be a period of 49 years, which equals a jubilee cycle. One jubilee cycle. So God doesn't use decades and centuries. He uses weeks and, and jubilee cycles. This is why we find the 70 weeks of Daniel 9 to be so interesting. All right. Now, look at my little chart here, and I want to show you something that's very neat. We're going to count years in terms of their their ordinal number prior to the birth of Christ. So we're going to count years in B.C. years, before Christ. So the year of the Exodus is 1437. Do you see that? I've highlighted that on the chart. And you see that that represents the first day of the week, Sunday. The Sunday year is 1437 B.C. The Monday year is 1436 B.C. The Tuesday year is 1435 B.C. and so on. So the Sabbath year 
The first Sabbath year is 1431 B.C. Do you see how a week of years amounts to seven years? And we are counting these years using the before Christ, the Julian count. We're counting them 1437, 1436, 1435, 1434, 33, 32, 31. All right. Now, look down at the bottom of the chart here, and I want you to notice what would, in fact, amount to the sixth week, counting as God counts years. This is the first week, 1437 through 1431. This is the second week, 1430 through 1424. You see the second sabbatical year is 1424 B.C. Because we start the count with the year of the Exodus. The seventh year is, a, is the synchrony of this count always dates back to the Exodus. That's a crucial point. And you'll find that God does this. Remember, in 1435 B.C., after two years in the wilderness, God sent the 12 spies in, and he was about uh, to take them into the promised land, and they refused to go. And so God said, okay, for 38 more years, a day for a year. You can find this in Numbers chapter 4. Uh, you'll find that uh, the count of years... God starts with 1437, or the year of the Exodus, for his counting of the years. Well, the point I'm leading up to is that in the sixth week of years, which began in 1402 B.C., that's the Sunday, that's the Sunday year. The Monday year is 1401, Tuesday years, 1400. The 41st year, on the 16th day of the month, this is when Israel entered the promised land. You can read that in Joshua chapter 5. Their first year in the promised land is a Friday year, and their first full year in the land of Canaan is a Sabbath year, 1396 B.C. Why this is interesting to me is that, you know, Adam and Eve's first day was a Friday. They were created on the sixth day of the week, and their full first full day was a Sabbath, seventh day of the week. And when Jesus comes, this is kind of interesting too, when Jesus comes, he comes right at the end of the Friday millennium, and the first millennium of the saints in, the, in heaven is the sabbatical millennium, or the seventh millennium described in Revelation 20. Well, we're out of time. <laughs> Boy, this is really interesting, and we've got a lot more to cover, and we'll look at that in our next segment. May God bless you is my prayer.